vision for the Ummah Muhammad Sallallahu is to see a world where every believer can live faithfully to his belief, building an exemplary Islamic community that benefits humanity. <laughs>
uh, both whether you call it secular or Islamic. And there is nothing called secular. Everything is Islamic knowledge, all from Allah. SubhanAllah. And we taught Dawood how to mend the metal in order to make weapons of war. And are you thankful for that knowledge, Allah says? SubhanAllah. So no, all ilm that is good is from Allah, nothing called secular. Uh, but at the same time, you want to also focus on the dini law knowledge at the same time as you get the knowledge of the dunya as well. Mm. So you need both. You need both. You can't have just one. And that's why I uh, I see mashayikh today, for example, those who only have Islamic knowledge, they're under the thumb of the masjid. The masjid committee tells them, go left. They have to go left, speak here, don't speak there. They can't speak. Mm. That's why they have no independence. And therefore, if you have no independence, you can't trust. You know, when we have a... When we have a, a, a research report written by a doctor, they have to write about whether they're affiliated to any of the medical companies that they are going to talk about their medicines. No. They have to say, I'm not affiliated, I don't have shares and blah, 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 right? Mm. You have to disclose. Imagine now you're already part of, the, of, of this particular masjid or that particular association and you're paid by them. You can't be independent. Mm. And that's why, you know, I speak my mind. I yeah. don't fear anybody except Allah. Azza wa Jal. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, I have no, you know, my... I don't worry about where my income is going to come from because I can just do that medicine. Mm. I put up a sign say, Dr. Chowdhury, patients are just coming, right? Yeah, so, right? So I so that's very important. That's why, you know, it's really important for anyone who's studying Islamic knowledge become independent. At the same time, those who are studying secular knowledge, you've got to realize that this is never going to help you, your muqiyama only on its own. It's you've got to realize that, uh, you know, just being a, a cardiologist, a doctor, a top doctor, that is not enough for you to save yourself on the akhirah. Are you going to come Yawm al Qiyamah and say, for 70 years I was ignorant about this, oh Allah, and didn't know how to pray, how to fast, how to give zakat? Allah is going to say, look, you can give that excuse normally, but for 70 years you didn't have the time? Mm. 70 years you're going to give that excuse? You can't. That's why uh, Ibn, Th- Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimullah, he said, he said, ignorance will never save you from Jahannam. Listen to what he said. He said, ignorance will not save you from Jahannam. It will not save you from Jahannam. It might save you from from being uh, have a bad hukum put upon you on that particular issue because you didn't know alcohol was haram or pork was haram. You didn't know that. So khalas, okay, now you have ilm, so don't do it again. But you can't claim that for 70 years, I didn't know alcohol was haram. Hey, hello, mm. what happened to you? Couldn't you Google it? Couldn't you sit with a scholar? Couldn't you learn? Yeah. 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 Il- so lack of knowledge will never... This is why everybody should seek a path to ilm and knowledge. And all knowledge is good khair, inshallah. But... In, speci- in particular, the knowledge of the Akhirah, of Allah and His Deen and Aqidah and Fiqh, this is the most critical, the ilm and knowledge. That will save you, Yawm Al-Qiyamah, inshaAllah. And then, and then the dunya knowledge will give you independence to use your ilmi knowledge and dini knowledge to talk without fear of anybody. SubhanAllah. JazakAllah Khair Shaykh, SubhanAllah. Now, um, I'm, I'm aware, obviously, um, you were very active um, in the past. The brothers were talking about the CDs they used to have of your talks. You know, mashallah. So there was a transition that you made um, from being more uh, the face of da'wah and and being giving out the lectures to taking a more, um, can I say, strategic strategic approach and being l- looking at the da'wah needs and managing the da'wah needs. Tell me, describe that transition. So uh, in, in 2015, alhamdulillah, I was already. Uh, I started my da'wah when uh, I think when I first came to UK would have been perhaps 2001, 2002, around that time. And then alhamdulillah since that time till now uh, I've been fairly active. In 2015 I saw the world taking a bad turn and I thought that just over-reliance on charity is not the best way. Mm. Plus we are a billion people. We can't simply keep on new project. We just fundraise in the masjid. People get tired of you. There's huge donor fatigue. Hmm. Uh, and there's a faster way of launching infrastructure projects or big projects that, uh, that the ummah needs, schools, hospitals, etc. by working with businesses rather than with individual client donors. And when I noticed huge donor fatigue and my vision was getting bigger and bigger and I saw that there was a disconnect yeah, between strategy. Hmm. So I had to change my strategy from what we call a B2C, which is business to customer, individual, yeah. retail, mm-hmm. into business bi- business to business, which is m- I as a business, for example, 
let's say I am a hospital operator, a school operator, right? Yeah. And I can then go to a asset manager who owns hospitals, who likes to buy hospitals, who likes to set up hospitals, and say, listen, why don't you set up a hospital? I'll rent it from you. Mm -hmm. Instead of me going to my local masjid and says, guys, i got a great idea. It's called a hospital. And then, you know, you can't even raise 100,000 pounds for your masjid. How are you going to raise 100,000 for a hospital? And you need not 100,000, you need 100 million for a hospital. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So you needed to talk in a different circle. So that meant that I needed to change my style mm -hmm. and my focus and the people that I was working with. And alhamdulillah, that allowed me. Very recently, alhamdulillah, I was able to launch my first hospital. Mashallah. Alhamdulillah, I also sold my first hospital, so that was good. Allah. So now I'm able to now focus on the, on these things, you know, and that showed me and validated my strategy mm. that that is the way. And then Alhamdulillah, this is what I hope that other mashayikh out there, mm. you know, they're all busy, busy trying to launch their own small masjids and uh, and dawah centers, etc. And no, no masjid is small. I mean, you know what I mean in yeah. size. Yeah. Uh, but my su my suggestion is to think differently, inshallah. And uh, and and get better results by focusing on uh, bringing in uh, business thinking into this, not so that it becomes a business. No, no, no. Yeah. But so that you know the asset can be owned by somebody, and then the operating business uh, that runs the runs the show uh, of this, for example, this studio, or runs the the operating school or the hospital yeah. can actually be uh, run by you. And and in that way, inshallah, you can ex explode and accelerate your growth, inshallah. Allah mubarak, subhanallah. What um, may I ask triggered that? You know that when you see in the world, how do you notice that the world was making a change in 2015? So what I noticed was some of the du'at, like you know, some of the well-known du'at. I don't want to mention their names, but mm -hmm. they were being they were being targeted by you know by um, unscrupulous individuals, lobby groups. Uh, and some uh, security agencies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That was primarily because you know they were so loud and they just promoted their own brand a lot. And that's why you know I don't even I'm not on TikTok these days. I'm not even on. I don't know when the last time I posted on Twitter. Um, I don't even not not even on Facebook. And uh, you know people ask me, Sheikh, what are you doing? I said, uh, <laughs> I'm doing exactly what I meant to. Trust me. <laughs> you just don't know what I'm doing. So yeah. So it, it, so. When I noticed that there was a change in the way that these mashayikh were being targeted, then I realized that centralizing everything under one name, one brand, is bad. Mm. And what if I become bad? So then my charities and my work falls. So that's why I decided that, look, guys, you all have to make yourself successful without Tawfiq's name being attached to anything. So most people don't know I'm involved in anything. Yeah. Uh, Alhamdulillah, I like it that way. Um, and that too, so that I'm not doing anything so that people can thank me for it in this dunya. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So that I, I can get thanks from Allah. That's what we want. No. So it's very important that we keep our names hidden. Not for anything except for our own hearts and our minds. Otherwise, it's very, very easy for us and our hearts to be to be corrupted. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. JazakAllah khair. Um, now, I want to ask you about, um, obviously, that, uh, thinking in that way, you know, having that kind of um, thought process and state of mind requires someone who is has a high aspirations. And um, my question is now: How do Muslims not only have get like inspire themselves to have high aspirations, you know, encourage themselves, train themselves, even maybe, but also how do they maintain high aspirations, and how do do they tackle the inhabiting uh, inhibiting sorry factors that may you prevent them from having high aspirations so look high aspirations is it's in our deen you know mm. for the example of the heavens and the earth of the competition begin let the competitors compete you know one wa an akuna awwal al muslimin so that i'm from the first of the believers qul inna nus in uh, inna salati wa nusuki wa mahyaya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alamin yeah. So like my life and my living and my death. I mean, you look at the way Allah is teaching us; He's inspiring us. Look at how Allah says, "Inna Allah shtara min al mu'minin anfusahum wa amwalahum bi anna lahum al jannah." Look at the way Allah says, you know, in Surah Tawbah, "Verily, Allah has purchased from the believers their lives and their wealth, and in return, Allah will give them jannah." You know what I mean? So. 
big, big, big verses. I mean, where are we from these verses and these tiny, small thinking and the small type of du'as that we're making? And yeah, Allah is able to do everything. Right. Why do we make such a small, tiny du'a to the one who's able to do everything? And it's, it's unbecoming, you know what I mean? And when you go to the king, you don't ask for something small, you ask for something big. <laughs> yeah, and he's the king of the universe. You could ask him for something bigger than the earth. Mm. So, <laughs> and our and our doors don't even go beyond our own family sometimes. Yeah. So we have to think big, and, and we see that our uh, our Prophet Sallam before he passed away, he set up uh, Yalamlam as the miqat for Yemen, and he set up Dhatu Irqin as the miqat for the people of Iraq and Juhfa for the people of Sham. Hello, hello. There was no Muslims in Sham. There was no Muslims in Yemen. There was no Muslims in in Iraq. There was Persians. So that shows you that he's a man of vision. Mm -hmm. He had great aspirations. He was giving the Sahaba uh, uh, an edge, saying that's where you focus next. Islam there, Islam there, Islam there, right? Mm -hmm. So this is how you have vision. You, we are the followers of a visionary prophet. Yes. There, there will not be a house of brick or mortar or clay, except that there will be a Muslim in it. What's he trying to say? He's trying to say, you make sure, oh my brothers, who are going to be my followers, you want to be in the Akhirah, then you follow my vision and achieve it for me because Allah wants to see me now. I've got to leave now. I'm 63 and Allah is giving me a short life. But with the hope that He will, He will, will, that we leave behind brothers who will take that mission and that vision forward. So that's what gives you vision and purpose. So we have a, a brother, his name was Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi and he passed away too early. But he left a huge dream behind. And it's incumbent upon us to achieve that for him. Right? And that's what gives me purpose today. That's, that's what gives me gives me that. And for anyone else out there who is confused and worried, and worried about uh, all the roadblocks, the biggest roadblock is the why. The question, uh, sorry, the question, how, mm. right? How am I going to do it? What do you mean, Check Tofik? You're going to say, you know, we're going to launch a school or ten schools? Ha ha! Was how you know hubris? That's so proud. That's so arrogant. You know, you think you can launch that many? You know, how? So, you know, my point has always been leave the how to Allah. <laughs> leave the how to Allah. You focus on the why. So if you can really focus on the why and you can keep on telling people why, the how will come together. I'll give you a simple example, okay? And this is very critical. Let's say you're marooned on an island. Mm -hmm. You want to get off the island, right? Just like Robinson Crusoe and the castaway, right? Mm -hmm. You're Tom Hanks, you're on the island. Yeah. You want to get off that island. How the hell are you going to get off the island? There's two ways. So you've got people with you, and you can say, okay, uh, you, Abdurrahman, you uh, collect all the wood, and you, uh, you go catch some fish, because we're not going to get hungry, and you guys go get, get all the ropes, and you tie up all the ropes, and then this is how you build a, build a ship, and you, know, you draw the ship on the ground, give them some ideas, and then people go and build a ship. What would happen when you do this? After the first wave comes and crashes down upon them, breaks the ship, or breaks the, the raft, or whatever you're building, that's it, they give up. Mm -hmm. But what if you do it my way? <laughs> this is how I would do it. Hey, what do you miss about UK? <laughs> what do you miss about Birmingham? Oh, Birmingham is, is Coventry Road. <laughs> it's, it's butter. <laughs> it's beautiful food. Yeah. There's nice restaurants. It's Greenland Masjid. Yeah. It's my mom's house. It's cooking. It's Karak tea. It's chai. <laughs> it's, do you understand? Yeah. yeah it's my wife. Yeah. It's a hot shower. Yeah. It's my kids. It's my car. It's my brothers. It's my friends. It's the soccer match. Yeah. It's the. You, do you understand? Yeah, yeah. You drive them wild with why. Why? I'm telling you, they will figure it out. They will figure it out. Yeah. They will figure it out. One of them will say, "Look, I saw this in one of the things." Another one says, "Look, I'm gonna get this done." Even if ten times their raft breaks, they're gonna keep trying the eleventh time. Because they miss Birmingham. You got it? Yeah. And that's what you got to do. That's what we don't do enough. We do too little of. Oh, guys, we need a school. It's already understood why we need a school. Now let's tell you about how we're going to do it. Oh, hello, hello, hello. Forget about the, 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 everything else. Focus only on one thing. Focus only on one thing. And that thing is simply why we need a school. Yeah. That's a com like completely different way of looking at something when you want to get something done. You know, the most of the time we s figure out the steps. How will we do this? You know, in the planning stages instead of the, the why are we doing this? Now, 
um as a muslim society we we all have roles now my question to you inshallah is to um ask you how do we how do uh, how do uh, what sorry the importance of the importance of the role of the sisters especially in the western society where we're living in the west um <coughs> how important is their role and what should their role be in this society okay uh, from my experience sisters are very focused individuals and mm. they mature a bit more faster than us mm. you know we 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 have our maturity when we are like 30 40 we yeah. all get there we both get there yeah right but we take a little bit of time, time. You know? <laughs> we got to enjoy you know yeah. I mean? we need our bikes we need our gahwa <laughs> you know what i mean we need to enjoy our life so we take our time but sisters something like get there earlier and they are they cannot we cannot rub every sister or brush every sister with the same brush mm. um, this a sister at the age of 20 is different from at the age of 30 at the age of 40 by the age of 40 she's already had her kids for example in especially in a muslim context yeah. they've had her children the children are growing up alhamdulillah they're perhaps in university yeah what is she doing with her life she's now at the prime of her life she's at 40 yeah right now of course also sh- her, 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 her her perhaps even her sexual desire has gone down so now she doesn't have to spend that much time with her husband. Mm-hmm. So she should be involved in the community a lot more at that age. Mm. She should become a teacher. In fact, I would say every sister should become a teacher. Because in every, you know, a typical Muslim family, three to four kids, in 10 Muslim families, you had already have a classroom. <laughs> right? Yeah. And a classroom needs three or four teachers because you've got different subjects. <laughs> yeah. So that means at least half of our sisters need to be teachers. Mm-hmm. And they need to be teachers. They need to focus on that. And I would suggest every sister, every sister focus on education. That's what I would say. Mm-hmm. Okay, That's the biggest hurdle for us right now is enough education is not there. There's far too many um, not yet Muslims uh, who are teaching right now. We need to have our sisters with our tarbiyah that have our buy-in that have been mothers as well so they understand. How many t- school teachers today have no children? They actually have never raised, so they actually don't understand. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I've noticed in my own school when I used to learn, the mother teachers used to be better teachers because they understood kids a lot more and they had more uh, safety and well being for the kids. They would understand when a child is actually not understanding something else is going on in their home, you know? Yeah. So they, they had that sixth sense, the mother sense. Yeah. So I would suggest to all sisters to become teachers, seriously, en masse, en masse. And, uh, at the same time, uh, I would suggest that all sisters focus on raising their kids initially whilst they are young until about university uh, schooling age. At that point, get into education, get into schooling, become principals, become head teachers, become uh, headmasters, etc., become school teachers and classroom teachers. So then, inshallah, you can teach the next generation. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and, and I would suggest uh, that... Uh, our brothers and our husbands understand that they should not keep their wives only in the homes um, because today we're in a unique situation where there's so much need and there's not enough good people to do it. So because I know the type of people that will listen to our podcast as well are a bit more practicing, a bit more interested. Yeah. So my suggestion is en masse enter into education. And, and alhamdulillah, education is well funded. You will have money. You will have a salary. So you're not going to do work for free. Also, it has lots of holidays, so you'll have time for holidays as well, yeah. uh, inshallah. And teaching makes you a good leader. And, and alhamdulillah, by, through teaching, you can also raise your children a lot better as well. That's my suggestion to all the sisters. Allah knows best. Allah barik uh, The other question I have is for um, primarily the youth. Now, um, growing up in, in, this, in this time and age, uh, especially living in the likes of UK or America or, or maybe even Australia, <coughs> What is, what kind of future should we be preparing for the for the youth, or what? How should we prepare the youth for the future? Does that make sense? I see. Yes. Look, the youth are are exceptional uh, individuals. They are the future, and the future is right now. Alhamdulillah, we are blessed in the Ummah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We have the largest amount of youth of any nation, right? Of any culture, any tribe, any race, any religion. Alhamdulillah. MashaAllah. And our countries, Muslim countries like Pakistan and Bangladesh and others, they have the largest amount of youth, mashallah. Okay? So we have a huge, huge blessing. I mean, Europe would would you know give their arm and leg in order to have what we have, right? Mm. Uh, because they are imploding 
you know, in terms of population, population whereas yeah. we're exploding in population. Yeah. Um, and but the youth are, they have certain qualities. Number one, they are easily distractible, and mm. impressionable. Mm. Uh, so they are not critical. They don't critically think. They tend to trust whatever they see in front of their eyes. Like Instagram, they see a picture and they trust it. Like, come on, this is a, a fake. Do you know that uh, everyone is smiling on Instagram? But they, that's because, you know, the other half when they're crying, they don't take a picture when they're crying. Do you yeah. understand? Yeah. These are all Snapchat filters that you're seeing, you know? <laughs> and you see that when you meet a person, hey, you look a lot more prettier in your IV, uh, iPhone picture. <laughs> <laughs> that's because of the phenomenal, you know? And, and, and the other day I saw a TikTok um, AI app that makes you look so handsome and so beautiful. Like, wow. So youth tend to trust what they see and they're not critical. They need to be critical. I mean, when you see a Coca-Cola advert, what do you see? You see this man with an uh, amazing beach body uh, that's glistening with sweat, drinking down Coke down, right? Mm. But the truth is when you drink Coke, you get fat, right? Mm. <laughs> so, so youth are not thinking critically. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and um, they need to be a bit more critical. When they, when they act a bit more critical, they will realize that the idols that they follow actually are not real really uh, real idols yeah. uh, and, and they're not meant to be followed actually they are very much human sometimes you are in a better situation than them so with, with youth I would encourage them to be a bit more critical that's number one number two with the youth um, I would suggest that mashallah there's no longer any barrier between age and success mm. uh, we find 18 year olds and 20 year olds becoming multi-billionaires as well as you know, 16 year olds finishing the university degree, age is not a not an issue anymore. Yeah. And we're in a land of opportunity. If you want any particular knowledge, knowledge is already available. If you want to make money, money is already available at whatever age. Uh, crypto is a perfect example how through crypto, some youth have become multi-millionaires, if not billionaires, you know, who have jumped on the bandwagon early. Yeah. So the point I'm trying to make, Akhi, is we live in a very different time from our parents. And our parents, they had to go through the, through the, through the, um, you know, th through the mill, they had to go through their schooling, then they had to go through university, and then they had to work for 10 years, and then they had to buy their homes. We don't have to do the same things. I own a hospital, I don't own my own house. Because I don't have to own a house. Why should I own a house? My house would tie me down. Now that I don't own a house, I can live a few years in Malaysia, next I can move to Dubai, then I can move to London if I wish, then I can go to Toronto, finally retire in Medina. <laughs> I could do what I want with my life. Do yeah. you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And with the money that I didn't focus on buying my house with, that I could actually spend on building my hospital, my idea, my vision that I had, as long as I had the courage to do so. So this is the new age. It's the age of the new of the new rich. The new rich are those who make money in the West and spend it in the East. Those who live in a in in one particular jurisdiction, but they earn in another jurisdiction, mm. right? And we we see that today. You could you could live in Bali, for example, you could live in Bali, but earn your income as a digital nomad from London, for example. Yeah. So this is the new age. And so I encourage the youth to experiment with these new ideas of becoming free mm -hmm. and, uh, and explore ideas of thinking really big. And with youth, you don't have to tell them. They all want to fix the world. That's they true. all want a better world. So the oh. new generation... Uh, uh, Z, you know these guys. They all want to change the world. They all ninety-seven percent of them want to change the world. That's that's the research. Yeah. So we don't have to tell them. We just have to liberate them from going through the same route that that everyone else is taking. Mm -hmm. And and that's how I ended up doing everything opposite. You know, everyone said do do your medicine first. No, I did Medina first. Then I came back to medicine afterwards. Yeah. You know, everyone said oh uh, work as a doctor, work as a doctor. I said no, I'm going to own a hospital rather than run a hospital mm. rather than work in a hospital. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. If you think different, inshallah, you will, you will have different results. And I think the youth must experiment with the opportunities given to us in the 21st century um, and gain as much knowledge as they can, gain different knowledge from the typical knowledge that they're gaining and learn how to excel in this world, inshallah. It's entirely possible right now. Exciting times we're living in. Allah Mubarak. You know, Sheikh, um, when I'm talking to you, I get um, <coughs> the feeling of um, we should we should really start looking at the world in a different way, and and start thinking in in outside the box, if you will, right? What do you think stops people from thinking in that way? 
because if this if we, what we're discussing now something that everyone was doing the world would be a different place of course but what is it that's stopping people from having this mentality it's the way that we've been raised mm. you know it's all we have just been lectured to mm. lecture 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 talk 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 that's not the way to learn there's many ways to learn there's experimenting there's traveling there is reading and and that's why i tell the youth and the new generation uh, if you just learn by only one style which is being told you're being told class teacher is coming in and he's telling you about the history lesson rather than you coming and learning yourself and then the question coming from the teacher and the class questioning about what you've already learned mm. so there is a different way of learning and the different way of learning allows you to not have preconceived ideas if you are didactic learning which is lecturing then they drill down ideas and thoughts into your head and as a result you start to think within those brackets already and that's what i guess is the biggest hurdle biggest hurdle is you think that you can't change because you need to use whatever tools you have knowledge you have money you have in order to do it let me give you a simple example to illustrate uh in in stanford university one of the mba professors did an experiment he told he told all the 500 class class groups you're all into groups of five everyone look under your table you got a hundred dollars you got one month in groups of five you got one month to make as much money as you can right all i'm giving you is a hundred dollars go away everyone went away the winners came back the the uh last one made 10000 the third one the third they got the third prize made $10000 from the 100 so the second one made 17000 right mashallah from the 100 so amazing yeah. how much did the first one make the one who won mm -hmm. they made 3.4 million subhanallah in one month what <laughs> the right how yeah. did that happen right okay so everyone got them together this is so important listen to this okay and the most important question was how did you do it <laughs> yeah. how did you do it what what did you do what was the idea listen to what they said they said as soon as we opened the envelope and saw a hundred dollars we realized that's a distraction that's a distraction the first thing we did we tore up the envelope we tore up the hundred dollars put it into the trash <laughs> subhanallah subhanallah okay subhanallah yeah so we said no that's a distraction because if only we think that we only have a hundred and we're going to think only with a hundred, that means we're not going to, we're going to have small ideas, ideas. small thinking. Subhan That's going to restrict us. Rather throw the money away, say we have no money at all now. Mm -hmm. And now all we have is our name, our brand, our links, our contacts, and whatever knowledge we have, right? And then now let's think about how to make money. That's when we used our leverage, we leveraged our contacts and our links and our... Uh, and our resources right yeah uh, without using any cash using our name and our brand and our networks and links and contacts that's how we made money i'm like oh my god that's what you got to do you got to stop thinking this is why when someone starts in business i usually tell them give all your money away to allah give it in sadaqah mm -hmm. because the money that you have is actually too little <laughs> okay for your ideas what you only have ten thousand pounds in your account that's not enough to you build even a, a, a you know a you know, you can't do. I mean, this is why everyone is trying to launch a, 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 a kebab shop. <laughs> yeah. When you say business, a kebab shop. Why? Because they only have 10,000 yeah. in their accounts. They can only re literally rent a kebab shop and, and, and do a little bit of fit outs here and then somehow launch it, right? Yeah. <laughs> but that's why it's th th this is not how you think. First, give your money to Allah. So, oh Allah, in your hands is better than my hands. Oh Allah, teach me. Oh Allah, guide me. Oh Allah, give me the links and contacts. Inspire me. That's how I got started. I gave my sadaqah, my money away in sadaqah and said, Ya Allah, I have got nothing now. Now, if you m keep me poor, then I'm one of the slaves who poverty does not help, Ya Rab. I need to be strong and wealthy. So you make me strong and wealthy. I'm going to help your deen. And then the first thing Allah inspired me is to go and speak to people who are very wealthy, billionaires. So I went and I spoke to, <laughs> I think, 17 billionaires. MashaAllah. And I said, no, I'm not going to speak to millionaires because they're stingy people. <laughs> I'm going to speak to mil billionaires because they're, they're wealthy and they've got... So much wealth, they can easily write you a check of 10 million. It wouldn't hurt them, right? Yeah. 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 And so when I spoke to billionaires, I realized, and I put a criteria. The criteria is billionaires who made money from zero. Mm. They were not like, you know, wealthy. Yeah, you know, inheritors. Uh, inheritors. Yeah. No, 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 nothing like that. Yeah. Then I realized there are individuals like you and me. They weren't particularly educated. Some of them, I was more educated than them. 
I knew more Quran than them. I knew more Hadith than them. I knew more Islam than them. I knew more medicine than them. I was more eloquent than them. I was prettier than them. <laughs> I was like, what the <laughs> heck? How, but how are you so rich and wealthy? Then I realized that they have the following. Mm -hmm. Number one is they have an edge. An edge. One thing and one thing only that they know how to do very well. Mm -hmm. Okay? Number two. The second thing that they have is that they realized how to do that one thing very quickly. MashaAllah. Repeat it as many times as possible, not just one. Yeah. But repeat, 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 repeat. Let me see the example. Right now I'm a doctor, for example. I yeah. know that I can charge 30 pounds for a patient, for example, if yeah. I was doing a private service, right? Okay. Now how can I do as many patients as I can, legally, possibly, yeah. within the time that I have? Yeah. Can I do 50 patients? Can I do 60 patients? Can I do 70 patients? Of course, I, was, I can't do that much. Obviously, there's a limit. But yeah. my point is, they have figured out how to do that one thing that gives them that small 5% profit, 10% profit, 10,000, 5,000. But how to do it so many times, as fast as possible, mm -hmm. that's how they made money. But they figured out one edge. And that's how I realized as well, people who trade in the stock market, people who buy shares and are profitable traders, they only have one clear strategy. You just need one thing, Akhi. You just need one thing. You don't need 50. You need one idea, but you've got to figure out how to do it infinitely, uh, uh, you know, recurring number of times. You know, do you understand? Yeah. That's what you've got to do. That's what you've got to do. That's how you become wealthy. It's fun. Right. Yeah. That's how you become wealthy, Akhi. Right? But figure out that one thing and figure out how to do it more and more and more and more times. It's fun. Right? I hope I haven't distracted too much no, from the no. original question. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. Allah you know. Because yeah. in, in that of itself, you know, talking about how we're educated, that we're more lectured to. You know, I think I heard a quote not too long ago. It was um, that we, we, our children, we're, we're educating or we're teaching them to a world that doesn't exist anymore. You right. know, our parents, they taught us the world that they knew and we're teaching the that we were taught by our parents and Absolutely. that world does not exist anymore no 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 no. you know no no problem. very different world yeah. and that's why i mean there is some st some truth in the statement that says that we have to raise our kids in a different way than our parents mm -hmm. raised us yes and no mm -hmm. in some things we shouldn't change yeah you know our, our attachment to our values yes um you know biral walidain the yeah. focus on excellence that our parents drilled into us yes that is all so valuable Akhi. that's one of the main reasons why i am here today alhamdulillah Mashallah. but one thing definitely is for sure the way they did it mm. the way they did it dad did it through engineering and he you know he launched his own business or he worked you know somewhere i don't i, sh I don't have to do it necessarily that way i could do it in a different way yeah and that's what makes me more successful in that i benefited from both yeah, yeah. I, I, I benefited in my values from my parents, but in my strategy, I benefited from how the modern people have achieved things. Uh, I've, uh, I've been thinking about something uh, that when we have a discussion prior to the, to the podcast, the brothers were talking, and that is um, the uh, Muslim identity and the suffering of an uh, infer inferiority pro complex where we, you know, we don't see ourselves in... Uh, and how and I think this covers almost also what we're talking about aspirations, you know, and being you know proud of your deen and that pride in your religion, leading to of course m wanting to do great things and you know quote unquote change the world, you know how do we get here and how do we fix this? It's easy. It's easy. You know, see one of the biggest problems is that you know we are um, starting off looking at Mount Everest. I mean, look at the small hill first. Mm. Meaning, um, one of the ways that we destroy our desires to achieve greatness and do big is sometimes we think that we need to get to, we need to climb Mount Everest tomorrow. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't have to be tomorrow. We have a great vision that's audacious goal, correct? Mm. Yeah. Absolutely critical. So you must have a vision like Mount Everest or a vision that beacons to you just like Mount Everest to every climber, right? You must have such an audacious goal, no doubt. Yeah. That is what will make sure that you have great uh, impact and great uh, effort that you put in. Yeah. Uh, it will create a bit of stress in your life, which is you stress, which is the good quality stress that will increase your impact and increase your efficiency uh, without creating harm. And that is not time restricted to tomorrow. 
Mm. It could be in 10 years or five years yeah. or 15 years from now. You with me? Yes. But where we need to win is we need to have small wins. Mm. I call it quick wins. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's what will help you validate your vision. So I always tell people or anybody I'm helping with in order in their vision, I say, Akhi, first work on the quick wins that you can get. Let's say you want to lose weight, but you want to lose 50 kilos because you're very overweight. Mm. 50 kilos is very difficult to lose. Mm. And that w the, the amount of uh, trials that you had, it will put you off. Rather, try to just fix one thing. Mm -hmm. What is that one thing? Let's try and achieve 10,000 steps. Not even weight. Don't even completely focus on, uh, you know, focus away from weight. Mm -hmm. Focus on 10,000 steps. Let's do 10,000 steps today. And we get a counter. We know that if you walk enough steps, you will eventually lose weight. Yes. So when you completely focus on something else, on something more achievable, yeah. suddenly you've got this dopamine hit in your brain that says, you know what, you can do it. Mm. You are self-motivating on your own because you've achieved small steps. That's and that's very critical. Mm. My suggestion is get the small steps done. Get the small goals done. Mm. That will be your own motivation, your own dopamine hit. That will be slowly pile up until you will then start to dream big. I didn't have a big vision from day one, Nahi. <laughs> I started to do small things. But when I started to win in those small things, I lost a lot as well. Mm -hmm. But when I started to win in those small things, that gave me the impetus to think very big. SubhanAllah. I, uh, I thank you for coming. Uh, it's been absolutely inspirational. And uh, I want you to, inshallah, conclude with this last question. And that is for the Muslim Ummah at the moment, um, with everything that's happening in the world, what is your vision for the next five, ten years since we were talking about vision? Where do you see this ummah or where would you like to see the ummah in five to ten years? Well, my ultimate vision for the ummah Muhammad Wasallam, is to see a world where every believer can live faithfully to his belief, building an exemplary Islamic community that benefits humanity. That's my ultimate vision. In, I would say in five to ten years' time, I would love that this Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, especially we're talking in the UK context, right? Mm. Uh, in UK, that we have new challenges that we focus on, that we have developed deep roots in society where Islam is seen as part and parcel of England. Right. We have deep patrons of the arts, we have patrons in politics, we have lobby groups, we have politicians that have entered and uh, and taken on major posts. Number of masajid are over five to 10,000. We have over a thousand schools. Um, we have a number of Muslim hospitals that are private hospitals with Islamic ethos. I would like to see at least 10 hospitals in the next 10 years. Uh, I'd like to see uh, that Muslims uh, have at least at least, I would say, 50 unicorns. Unicorn is a 50 million pound organization. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see 50 fast moving unicorn organizations where Muslims have pioneered this, you know, and Muslims have uh, entered uh, and formed um, associations like Muslim chambers of commerce that have power and izzah and strength where the Prime Minister of England attends our annual event Mashallah. because he, w he needs our blessings. To Otherwise, you know what? We are too powerful mm. economically. Mm. Uh, that's where the strength is. Uh, and I'd like to see that uh, the universities and the ISOCs are extremely effective organizations. Mm. Extremely effective organizations. Um, I, I want people to see Islam as an alternative way of life and form of thought. Not simply the liberist, the, liber the liberalism that we are engrossed in today. Uh, I'd like to see Islam to be um, the in thing, inshallah. <laughs> that would be that would be what I would hope for. And finally, uh, I would hope that the imams uh, become next level imams. That no longer are they normal imams. A typical imam is not something that you send your weakest son or your weakest child to. You send your best to become an uh, imma because they are well paid, well educated, well looked after, as aspirational individuals, visionary people. You attend one khutbah and the hair on the back of your back of your shoulder rises up from fear of God and you feel like that's it, I'm charged up. I'm gonna I'm gonna do so much more for Allah. You know what I mean? 
Those yeah. are the imams that I'd like like to see uh, occupy our members. And uh, and, I, and I'd love to see UK being at the forefront, or the Muslims in UK, at the forefront of guiding the rest of the Muslim minorities in their progression towards a strong ummah, inshallah. Subhanallah. May Allah make it all, you know, come ameen, true. Amin, Ya Rabbi. Before Allah our death, Amin, Ya Rabbi. Allahumma Amin. Uh, Sheikh, it's been an absolute pleasure and honor to have you, you know, on pod this podcast. Thank you for having me. Honor is all mine. Thank and uh, I, I, I hope I get to have you soon. I know you travel a lot, and you, we're not, you know, as close as uh, as you were to cl in terms of you know the parts of the world that we live in. Uh, but mashallah, things are online now. But it'll be amazing to have you back on uh, the actual podcast. Zakallah. Well, Allah Allah bless you. And give you a lot of success, and I hope everyone benefits and uh, really. Uh, uh, stops being afraid, right? Yeah. Throw this fear out, you know. And the fear of fear is worse than the fear itself, you know. <laughs> and inshallah, have a big dream and Allah will achieve it for you. Jazakallah khair. Barakallah khair. And with that, inshallah, we end uh, this episode. It's been uh, an absolute pleasure. I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and foremost for allowing us to be here and to have this discussion. And then, of course, I thank our Sheikh for coming and enlightening us uh, with beautiful conversation and beautiful benefit. Uh, for those who are watching, remember to like, share, subscribe and leave in the comment section what you benefited from and what you would like to hear from us here at Beyond the Mimbar. Until next time, I've been Muhammad Basaid here with Sheikh Tawfiq Chowdhury. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdika shadu la ilaha 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 ila